Welcome to UVA Medical Center Hour. I'm Irene Mattia, Assistant Co-Director of the Program in Health Humanities here at the UVA Center for Health Humanities and Ethics. We're delighted to see you joining us both in person and virtually today as we talk to and learn from Dr. Laura Colby and celebrate her new book of poems, Little Pharma. Just a brief word about the structure for today's event. All of our speakers have completed conflict of interest statements and have no disclosures. Please note that the continuing education credit that can be claimed for today's event. Um, for that, we invite you to follow directions at the bottom of the handout posted in the chat to claim your continuing education credit. And when the time comes for Q&A, please send your questions through the Q&A option on Zoom, which I will be monitoring, or if you're here in person, simply raise your hand. Now I'll introduce our speaker for today. Laura Colby, MD, MPhil, is an assistant professor of medicine and assistant clinical ethicist at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center in New York City. Her debut poetry collection, Little Pharma, won this year's Agnes Lynch Starrett Prize and recently was published by the University of Pittsburgh's Pitt Poetry Series. Dr. Colby studied English and American literature at Harvard and at the University of Cambridge before receiving her MD from the University of Virginia, where she was a Hook Scholar in Humanities and Ethics. She then completed her medical residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston before moving back to New York City to join Weill Cornell's Clinical Scholars Program in Hospital Medicine and pursue a fellowship in medical ethics. Dr. Colby has an illustrious publication record including poetry, fiction, personal essays, and criticism in publications such as the New York Review of Books, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, The Nation, American Poetry Review, Conjunctions, Poetry, New England Review and Virginia Quarterly Review, Yale Review and elsewhere. For additional information, she does have a website you can visit or follow her at Laura K. Laura Colby MD on Twitter and we will share her website as well, which should be in your handout. I just wanted to, to say as an introduction to her book, which I've been really enjoying reading um, the past couple of weeks, Little Pharma is truly a mystical delight. Leading the reader from the ICU bedside to Virginia countryside, this book is equal parts wit and observation, stirring in their precision. In this golden age of poetry, as the poet Ada Limon recently termed our time, Colby's language still surprises. She writes in one poem, enter this sick room, bugged with surging Pentecosts of light, the green tracings of the representative heart, permit now its miraculous whim. Of Little Pharma, UVA's own Lisa Russ Spar writes that it combines the urgent immediacy of a live performance with the close-up scrutiny of a microscope. This book revises what we thought we knew about sickness and health by inviting us to revision them, and Colby's vision is an unforgettable one. So without further ado, I'll turn the program over now to Dr. Laura Colby. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Mattia. That was really uh, such an incredible and warm welcome. Thanks to all of you. I am so honored to be here. And it's especially fun for me to be here in this context as an alumna of the UVA School of Medicine, a former Hook Scholar, as you mentioned, um, and to see so many familiar and beloved faces in the audience here tuning in. Um, I think of this as an opportunity to reintroduce myself afresh and bring a different facet of my life and work to the table that I don't normally get to share in the everyday context of being a hospitalist and a medical educator and a clinical ethicist. I'm especially grateful to Dr. Mutter, Dr. Mathieu, of course, and the Center for Health Humanities and Ethics for being open to reinventing and expanding what can happen under the aegis of such a speaker series. Thank you so much for making this a space to celebrate the multiplicity and interdisciplinarity of medical ethics and the medical humanities as we find more and more ways to speak across disciplinary and institutional lines and across different bodies of expertise. I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about my own story of switching allegiances or really maybe multiplying allegiances across different fields and art forms, and then talk about some of the intersecting concerns that I see between poetry and clinical practice. I wanna move then towards reading some individual poems, leaving I hope plenty of time for conversation at the end. So a little bit about me. When I was an English major and then a graduate student of English, I felt both at home and not. 
it felt almost like I was fluent in all the nouns of one language, but my verbs were coming from a different language entirely. And so I couldn't quite convey what I meant to do or to be. My syntax wasn't right. Or maybe it was like driving in the car and not quite noticing at first that one back window is cracked open a bit. There's just this draft, a kind of beating shift in pressure, a sense of the outside leaking in with its heat and its chill, but not quite conscious yet, just a sort of open pore or portal. Shortly after I left that field and wondered what I might do instead, um, one of the routes that that took me you know, as I volunteered to teach a storytelling workshop in New York City in the Lower East Side at a community center for people who use IV drugs, where they could get safety and help and a warm place to hang out. There's a lot now thinking back that I regret about the way I ran that workshop. I didn't know anything about trauma-informed care, for example, and how to help people feel okay, even when stories feel scary, how not to pick at old wounds in ways that would feel dangerous. But it did give me a window onto the many physical and material and medical practical needs that people have over and above their need to share narrative. And it made me, someone who had always doodled her way through science class, interested in going back to school and becoming a doctor to see what kinds of tiny useful things I might be able to get done in a day for the relatively small number of people who cross in front of my stethoscope and sit there patiently while I ask them to roll up their shirt or breathe deeply or cough, and then wait for me to tell them what I hear inside their bodies. I love this work, which constitutes most of my day job now away from poetry, along with, of course, uh, my work in uh, our own center's ethics division and in other academic projects and roles that I hold in the Department of Medicine. But in all of these realms, sometimes if I go too long without making creative work through my writing, I feel the same way I did as a student of literature, that I'm only speaking some parts of a language and yet some aspect of the grammar is jammed or like the car window has gotten cracked open again. It's that sense of other places, other homes calling me out to pull me over. I know that many of you affiliated with the center uh, or more broadly in the extraordinary inter interdisciplinary space that is UVA and is one of UVA's great treasures are also individuals who balance or juggle or tumble among um, dual or multiple vocations. So I imagine you know what I mean by this feeling of being stretched over the threshold between different worlds. The phrase medical humanities can mean a great many things. Is it a discipline? Is it a way of asking questions? a set of interventions to correct something that's gone terribly wrong about medicine? Is it a framework for collaboration across fields? It might be all of these at different times, but one shorthand I like at the moment is the phrase, not coined by me, of experimental entanglements, which suggests that we don't know in advance what will happen when all of these disciplines get near each other. It's an experiment. And that in their nearness, they might get very intimate indeed. We might even find ourselves in some painful knots. It's putting our own ease and comfort just a bit at risk because we might uncover some new truth that pinches or that makes some overwhelming demand. Like in Rilke's poem about being in the presence of a broken Greek statue of Apollo when the marble itself seems to cry out to him, you must change your life. My own route through the medical humanities and through medicine is so far less as a theorist or critic and more as a sort of artisan or mechanic. As a doctor, I treat patients. As a fledgling clinical ethicist, I talk to people, I analyze situations. As a poet and a creative writer, I make poems and essays and other things. As an academic, I write papers and give talks and so on and so forth. All of these crafts involve a lot of technique and a lot of grunt work, as I know you know. And of course, they're each rich vocations unto themselves with more than enough material to fill up a life. So I'm not always sure why I feel compelled to keep entangling them with each other, making more trouble for myself in the process. Sometimes I think maybe I just like trouble. Another way to answer this question of why, why pursue this entanglement, this experiment, is to start by asking, when it comes to the humanities and to health and medicine, what would be missing or would be present but only very tiny or underdeveloped if we had just one without the other? 
So here's a thought experiment. Imagine how strange it would be to go to an art gallery and see 10 still life paintings of a bowl of fruit by 10 different artists and for them all to look precisely identical down to the brush stroke. Now imagine how strange it would be to chat with 10 doctors in the same hospital, each treating a patient with the exact same kind of pneumonia and for each patient to be getting a completely different kind of treatment. One gets antibiotics, one is prescribed plenty of rest and sunshine. Maybe one is told to write down his wish to get better and bury it under an apple tree during the full moon. One is given a foot massage and so forth. In the first instance in the art gallery, we know instinctively about art that it accommodates and even demands our difference. You take up your art in part because what you do with it will be different than what your mentors or your peers do even if you start from the exact same technical foundation, even if you and some other artists have grown up in the same place and are perhaps the same age, gender, race, class, whatever else. Art is not just a byproduct of experience, but it cannot happen without having had experiences. And yours are uniquely yours, right down to the fly that landed on your sleeve or the time you got hiccups while standing in front of a Rembrandt painting or while standing at city hall waiting to get married. Your idiosyncrasy is one of your most valuable treasures. In the second instance, that of the doctors treating pneumonia, we know by habit and training that there are right ways and wrong ways to go about the management of particular diseases. Fortunately, we're living in an age in which many different approaches have been measured against each other. So that to just go pick your own novel method is to be actively unhelpful, maybe even inhumane or cruel to the person who could benefit from the collective standardization of a particular therapy. To some extent, in many aspects of my job, I know that I'm doing a good job as a doctor when my work is indistinguishable from other competent practitioners. It would, in fact, probably be a subject for shame or chagrin if someone poked their head into a hospital room, took one look and said, oh boy, that NG tube was definitely a Colby job. That's pretty much a sign that something has gone terribly wrong. <laughs> If a patient has sepsis, I'm going to give them IV fluids at the recommended rate and antibiotics and nothing else. If someone's heart stops and I know that they wanted cardiac resuscitation, I'm going to push on their sternum about 110 times per minute to the internal tune of staying alive or the Macarena or like a prayer or holla back girl, all of which are about the same rhythm. It works great, about five centimeters deep, exactly the way we're taught. This is true to a less quantitative, but still considerable extent in my verbal interactions with patients too. How I give them news of a bad diagnosis, how I interact with patients who have particular behavioral or cognitive conditions or certain traumas, where I could really make a hash of things if I don't enter the conversation with a plan or even a script sometimes. This is even true for some or perhaps many aspects of being a clinical ethicist. Yes, there's room for improvisation and surprise, but also, of course, there's a plan and one bolstered and tightened by years of professional tradition, scholarship, the law, and so forth. In all of these ways, medicine, and to a certain extent, medical ethics, are deeply, even majestically self-effacing professions. It is emphatically not about me, nor is it an especially capacious place for my hot take. That is mostly a very good thing. But at the same time, there's often little room for the expression or the working through of what the literary critic Cyan Guy famously calls ugly feelings, meaning our negative affects that are neither strong enough to be heroic nor precise enough to be useful, irritability, anxiety, boredom, and so forth. My clinical work maybe brings forth my best self, but it's also a constrained or a smaller self, like a photograph or a telescopic view of my body that's zoomed out far enough, you can't see any lines or wrinkles on my skin or my clothes, no stray dog hair, not the old sports scars on my knees, not the moles that run in my family, just a general non-specific personhood. And maybe this photograph is so zoomed out that you can't even judge anymore how tall I am or how much I might weigh or whether I'm a woman at all or just some other plant or animal, kind of a satellite's view, a, a space view. And though, of course, it's not always true, this is what medicine can feel like sometimes, that in order for me to be what patients need, I am a little less specifically myself. Or another way of thinking about it. 
Robert Frost famously called writing free verse like playing tennis without a net. In other words, no fun, because how do you know if you're overcoming something hard? How do you know who wins? This seems to me like a slightly macho perspective, as though effort itself was proof of something's value. But Frost's imperfect metaphor reminds me that conversely, at least for me, clinical work without the aid of art and poetry can feel like trying to play or to achieve some kind of freedom of motion from underneath a haystack sized pile of nets. There are a lot of forces, some quite beneficent, others a little less so, that are out to constrain you, to hem in play. Poetry to me has always felt like a Goldilocks approved amount of netting. Not too much, not too little, still some play, still some struggle. Like tennis with approximately one net. One more thought and then I will switch to reading some poems. In 1902, the journalist Finley Peter Dunn gave us the old saw we've heard countless times that the job of the newspaper was to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And many writers, including the poet Lucille Clifton, have uh, repeated and um, kind of repurposed this adage as a talisman for their own work. The poet and the essayist Mary Royfel tells the story of the design and planning of the Dia Beacon Museum, a museum of contemporary art in the Hudson Valley. The museum's designers thought a person should be not too comfortable when looking at art. In fact, art should make a person uncomfortable. And therefore, by design, they programmed the heating and cooling to make it too cold in the winter and too hot in the summer. Now, you might say that this was just to save on energy bills. And you might say this is entirely apocryphal. And you might be right. I'm not sure that Mary Royfel is always telling the truth in her work, even though she's a poet and an essayist who I admire very much. But the idea that discomfort might be a good thing, might be a helpful chemical substrate in which the truer truth can develop itself, strikes me as right. There is blood in the culture after all. That's what makes the organism grow so that we can find out what exactly is going on. The bioethicist Al Johnson and the sociologist Paul Starr, among many others, have both written about how before medical ethics became its own cohesive field in the second half of the 20th century, and perhaps one of the most interesting and productive experimental entanglements between the humanities, health, and medicine, medical ethics used to be much more hazily defined, know it when you see it kind of thing, and not very clearly distinguished from bedside manner or even good manners generally. In fact, when the English physician Thomas Percival wrote his book that he called a manual of medical ethics in 1803, he promised readers that they could learn inside how to soften their manners and take on the character of a gentleman. Part of its wild success derived from would-be doctor's desire to know how to pass across class lines, to pass, for example, for white, well-to-do Christian male straight to do what we might now call code switching, to leave their background behind or at least hidden. Even as late as 1949, the surgeon John Morley was writing in academic journals that ethics and etiquette are in medical life at any rate, so inextricably intermingled that it is more convenient to treat them as one and the same thing. In my own admittedly very early career, in medical ethics, I've already realized to my relief how foreign and how far this old conception of ethics as etiquette is to the contemporary clinical approach to ethical problems. Politeness is great, of course, but the point is not to disappear behind an all-purpose genteel manner, but rather sometimes to ask questions that are hard to speak and hard to hear. Though it's not the primary point, this process can sometimes, at least for me, do just what the Dia Beacon Museum planners wanted, to take the room's thermostat for a really hard spin and sometimes even afflict the comfortable, myself very much included. I like to think that being a writer of poetry is one of the things that's made me a tiny bit better at provoking and withstanding discomfort than I might've been otherwise. That it's given me in its small, quiet way a slight streak of the uncompromising in the sense of sometimes needing to chase down the right image, the right word, the right turn of phrase, even when it seems laughably indulgent to give so much labor to such a little piece of art, even when it's a bit hard to explain or hard to get. In a similar fashion, when something arises for me as a doctor or a medical ethicist that I know I must be steadfast to, 
some great truth about a patient or a situation that the healthcare system would rather ignore because of its inconvenience or its expense. Having this obstinate streak as a poet can make it easier for me to turn on my mulishness for those occasions too. This might be one of the minor ways, though of course not the only way, in which art making is political, that cultivating an obstinacy about getting one's craft right, cultivating rigor, cultivating a certain dogged returning to the same side of the work, can perhaps in the long run enable one to turn to those same inner resources for other demands of our common political and social life as well. So now about this book. I think of the poems in this collection, not quite as fiction or nonfiction, but really as dreams, visions, unexplored forks in the road. The first one I'll read is from the opening poem in the book. Uh, it's called The Tower, and The Tower is the title of a famous Yeats poem, but it's also what everyone called the big high-rise part of the hospital where I trained as a resident. It was mostly a pasty stucco with patches of this kind of mirror-like glass on it, sort of like scales, a really spooky and kind of alienating building um, to step into. So this opening poem lays out some of the sense of terror or inadequacy, imposter syndrome um, that one might feel and that kind of sense of entrapment that can seize someone early in their career working in such a place as a trainee. And so um, uh, the book sort of begins in a place of um, a sort of crouched defensive position of kind of fear and overwhelm and then kind of gradually grows towards the light, I guess, like a plant in the window. So just to give you a taste of, of that, um, and sorry, just a sort of $10 wor word alert. There is a roar qual in this poem, which is a species of extinct whale. Um, that came up for me because some of the procedure kits that you're given to do procedures in the hospital, you know, you do this drapery and it already has this hole cut out. And it kind of reminded me of like the blowhole of some kind of mysterious marine creature. So the tower. Into the reflective tower I came then, although I had no mandate and my stethoscope at home, holding the sharded road noise through its neck. I was given a box of toys for doctors, a gavel to dismiss a knee, a light that brought out blood behind the human lens, a funnel for ears, every size compatible with the hunt, a list of every kind of fire, each paired to a telephone. Linens ruled the back stairs, long coats, overshoe slippers, sheets fashioned after whales, a weepable top eye like the extinct roar qualls and those living. Each hold linen paired with burstable ampules, bleach and spirits to rub through the eye to the skin. Like church art, not one thing had a meaningful back. This was not church. My friends were not absent. I was still in sin, possibly late, and it was a tower after all. A wreath on the table, chewing itself softly, like a dog on its own tail. Bells were pulled for almost nothing, just counting. Unlike year or season, the week is not real in sky terms. In the tower, the best medicines in two bags like twins brought together are strong on the spot. One does not believe in them. One rather steps abreast of their system and observes outcomes from the oily and marine ones, the powders, gases. One does not depart. The tower is too awake and discloses new extensions off its telescope spine, the color of dried yogurt. One stays then and the world walks out as though at large. These next two poems are both called Intensive Care. Um, they both sort of start out as kind of burnout poems, but then they, they try to move and grow elsewhere and towards being able to see something that's sublime and mysterious and even beautiful in the work, even at its most extreme. Intensive Care. I am tired of playing death's white clerk I will stand in the glove closet eating an orange. 10 fat bulbs acrostic to the Warren wards. Segment 
You are twin to endless sisters, but this buttered vein is yours. These strings parting your head, officious as batons, chest puffed with documents. This wet parade ground mucking my hand, it almost cheers me not to be the lone creation formal unto sludge. Why to be imparted with mouth like a clock that points itself out, my word, my word. The orange warms in my hand. Runnel of pepper, palm glow, squalid, less than light. Stirs still some crepitant waking to gold as to a molar filling, dislodged, a swim on a vacant pillow. It is 3 a.m. The telemetry insists. Around me, they seed their small bitten flaws, the pulses there are. Intensive care. This one has a word in it um, called loess, L-O-E-S-S, -S, which means bits of mineral that have been flung about by the wind and piled up together. One might write it, arm beneath the side rail, channel changer smothered under thigh. Then think again, these parts might roll back. Beds, pinned corners clasped against another grim ectasia. A patient prong-ended in the coverlet a shirt breeze stiffened about a line. There are trinkets on the flip side of forgetting, a new study on the last days in the brain. Words take texture, leaf, there's no accounting for. Bent limbs, sancta, stranded lois in beds, how receptive to revision and the dark. See how my brain intercalated loss before it even bared my hand. Looms the face of next caregiver, spinning up the corridor like a clock in love. All hands, all hands, a chant of sinking or circle singing. That dire, that dialect, its rung syntax lemoning the morning, lit and sour as a welt. A patient turned like a pillow blemish. Doctor, I don my day face like a net of cathodes, drained of all eruption, non-particular, whose mask and sign is sun. Enter this sick room, bugged with surging Pentecosts of light, the green tracings of the representative heart. Permit now its miraculous whim. The next poem I'm going to read is called Little Farmer's Research. Um, and as some of uh, this kind of suite of poems came together, I realized that I could um, go different places and be a little bit more vulnerable and honest um, by creating this um, kind of alter ego character that I call Little Pharma. Um, and uh, the fun thing about a kind of persona poem is you get to put in as much truth and autobiography as you want, but also kind of flirt with different emotional lives, different possibilities that are, that are you know, not strictly in the realm of historical autobiography. Um, and this one is about just the um, kind of uncanny order of magnitude problem that you have sometimes as a uh, student or someone who works in a lab that you're kind of working with the micro and the, the more you zoom in, the more plenitude you see, and then you kind of walk out to the real world and it's a whole other scale and that kind of, uh, visual or sensory whiplash um, is heady and dizzying and intoxicating, but also a little bit confusing, I think. So Little Pharma's research. Sometimes when I leave the lab, what's outside seems some detail of anatomy still, as if always the metal gurney underlay the day. A man's jeans forming two blue veins coursing beside my bed. The lamp's sharp punctum where light spools under the fixture. Street noise leaking as through a weak wall in the heart. The anatomist's awe of layers above all. Five skins between work shirt and rectus abdominis, hardly different from my skipping flat rocks, minding the many ways they waft out and fall in, or my Skyping an old lover, two skins, two apartments back. Of course, the reverse is just as true, like all the brightest lies. In the lab, I meet the rest of life, 
all the world packed in one corpse, the body a kind of government, a flame red senate wrapped in fur. Its provinces, all fens and rivers, two-bit hucksters stamping wet booted outside the commissary store. Out along the farthest limbs, nerves open dove cuts for the wheeling flocks, homing, homing, home. When I first met my hands, their small largesse, they and I, we three, were amazed. In the lab's locker room, they peeled off my scrubs, glowed blue with a cold I couldn't yet feel, but knew as mine. Little match girls, little lights. What is there to love about this world without proportion? Impossible to tell if one body is two or five, to tell whether when I lie under my roof, it's about to slough right off. Wizened epithelium, raw life lying beneath it, tasting the night as new syrup serum sky. Um, this next poem um, grew out of an opportunity that I had through the Hook Scholars Program, actually. Um, I spent a summer um, volunteering in some clinics and also writing poetry in Southwest Virginia. And um, one of the places where I was um, focusing my work was at a, a free clinic that was mostly for Appalachian miners and their families. And um, the title refers to different kinds of local snakes. Um, and one of our patients uh, was surprisingly the, the um, sort of young man who mowed the lawn outside. This is about an interaction with him. Garter copper water. He's my age, and for once in wise Virginia, I believe it. Same confused complexion, baby pimples, nose and chin, around the eyes, first fine contrails, scratching vacant sky. Same dislike to sit while others stand. Same no gold band. He's clean. I like the way he preened today before clinic, though he circles us most warm days in oily t-shirts, mowing our field, taking care of our snake problem. He hands me the old inhaler dimpled with bites, the times he dug when air couldn't come fast enough. I thank him and set it aside like a piece of jewelry too nice for the day or one that would clasp too much. The snakes were in frenzies of lust this year, record-breaking litters and a den in every teardown past Guest River toward the mines. He gets them with his shovel or his truck, one filthy time with his push mower. King snake, queen snake, milk snake, green snake, garter, water, copperhead, hog nose, all these snuff photos on his phone, all these dead frog eaters, ankle biters, 15 bodies later, they seem less like killers and more like a grammar, giving and taking breath and stops between their short, hollow teeth. How many would really bite? You don't wait to find out if it's mean. There's a clay red corn snake I can't unsee, flayed skin like a mother's last touch on a wrapped birthday present, cool silver stream of scissor sucking red ribbon to its current, then releasing it, twisted and astonished, the stiff bright spiral that means in every language, I took great pains with this. This next poem is called uh, Puck in Oncology. And um, it's about being a medical student. And uh, one time when I uh, was assigned to do this, this endless and, and very rote and precise um, kind of history taking with uh, a patient who had a brain tumor. And I was just feeling awful about how I was botching the whole thing and taking forever. And, and meanwhile, to top it off, her father comes in holding her like an ice cream sandwich. And he's waiting for me to finish as I'm conducting the interview. And you just see it like oozing down his arm. It was really humiliating. Um, 
so it, uh, it, it slightly fictionalizes, but, but it um, grows from that experience. And um, Puck, you probably know, is a, a fairy in Shakespeare's play of Midsummer Night's Dream. And uh, he breaks the fourth wall a few times during the play just to tell the audience like, don't worry, I know this is a little stressful, but this isn't real, it's just a play. Um, and so his line about, you know, if we shadows offend, um, don't worry, it's just a play um, comes up in this too. And uh, for me, I, I feel like at, at moments in training and, and even currently, to be honest, um, sometimes the enormity and the kind of sublime terror of what we do is, is so much that uh, it, it helps me to sort of tactically disassociate for a moment and be like, you know what, this is, this, this isn't real. <laughs> I'm just kind of, you know, um, play my part in the play. Um, so it's a little bit about that as well. Puck in oncology. We think we've seen the last of snow. New sheen hangs from the female doctor's hems. Have they torn off insect wings, crocus hearts, stitched them to dresses? The men's shoes squeak and sigh, lighter, sleeker by the shift. All fresh, loud, talk melting from the nurse's bay, running silver fingers to the rooms of stunned, unthawed sick. Early March, everything's in evidence, smashed vellamy hostas, skin of mud on parking lots, and inside, scores of eyes and knees, round and pale as birdful eggs. A miniature woman, I think, or badly stretched and sharpened little girl, sits in her bed. Chart says she is 35. Names it, the banked spring onion skull to nape. Astrocytoma, like you could peer under her ponytail and see the sky. Her little crop sends shoots around those terrains of mind that give off hunger and thirst. So she says she wants nothing. So little fat around her mouth making the word. Her father back from the cafeteria, pink and heaving, plants a chocolate good humor bar in her hands. Wonders how long I've been here poking. Nine questions more till I can disappear. By number three, she gives me what? A glare, her pity. Surgery has slacked the muscles of her eyes. Her fingers rustle the red wrapper to a pulp. The father, I know, wills it to her mouth. Questions five, six. I know how a good humor melts. The little outer flex loosen and slide as the cream skin under them changes expression, a slow smile or sigh. Pretend it's a game, I tell myself, more savage days. If I offend, it will be forgotten by summer when new bodies take up old beds and on stifling hospital grounds, the plotted bulbs are all turned under. And um, I think I'll read one more and then leave some room for conversation. Um, this last poem I'm going to read is called uh, The Countable. And it takes as its jumping off point the uh, line in the Christian gospel about um, the idea of God being um, someone who would be so absolutely um, attentive to the entire world, that he would notice uh, the fall of one sparrow, um, that he would notice every single lily in the field and just have this kind of in infinite uh, attention. And um, that reminds me a little bit of, of some of the, um, the work we set ourselves as clinicians. You know, I feel like we spend a lot of the day sort of running the list or counting noses. Did I forget about you? Did I forget about you? Did I forget about you? So there's this, um, you know, sort of, uh, aspiration to to be attentive to the fall of the sparrow and the lily of the field though obviously it's kind of a, an impossible ask um and so this one sort of starts out from the standpoint of the the fallen bird and then switch switches to the personal the countable to be among the countable be scant as bird in air Oily mutter of unreaping wing is enough. Dropping seeds that plants may dumbly grow is enough. Slamming the glass, shiner to shine when your bill hits porch window 
your phantom rival flared up and gone. Sorehead, be master of thump and ding. That is enough to be counted in books of the living, maybe saved by a nut brown hand, suet buffed, brought to a bosom of happy enumeration. I was doing my best at the breakfast table with boxed cornflakes and the last slug of milk when the first bird dropped, heavy as a child's trophy, its ember soaking air from my yard. It seemed my job to take note, its glass skewed wing, its sacral rage, in case I was the Count's one deputy that day. What a god of suffering. I pulled the shade. I was ringing laps in a Sunday night grocery, everything smudged in the old week's rouge, soft in my belly as an oyster making love. It seemed no one could note as I did the dusty pecking of a man at the free cheese tray, how he studied the prices of Capicola, took four toothpicks of Swiss, swizzled his brow, took seven more. Of course, I only watched with no idea which of Knight's Tolman charged him on the cold walk home. Of course there is a count. Of course there is a shining booth where tickets are redeemed for fuzzy things, or simply someone holds your hand under a butter moon, tells you of your five fingers, whispers that even a sixth would be beautiful on you. Even a hand known to claw after gym cracks, beautiful. The toothpicks trailed him like frost at the edge of a department store fire, wholly white and still while his ground floor of perfumes wrapped hoods of burnt sugar on the speechless. If I cotton to an ultimate mercy, it is one of two ply robes and hammered velvet, the kingfisher humming talus to the sunset, sure, but also many thin clerks and reeves nervous to exist, an attic of abacuses dozing in crackalore, a little behind time in their contributions flocked with eraser tongues. If I fall after you, it is because of the baked Alaska in my chest, which wants to be a tower of alternating pains snugged in cloud, but is running from an unplanned heat, its several colors streaming from the base. Count them. Before they mix to gray brown, they are yours. I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Colby. That was really, really lovely. I want to open it up now to questions, comments, conversation. And if there aren't any yet, I will, I have a few, but um, if you're watching online, please remember that you can leave questions in the Q&A section and I will be monitoring that. So I don't see any at the moment. I see a question in the audience though, go ahead. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, hi, fourth year medical student and uh, current Hook Scholar also, so very happy to be hearing from you today. Um, it was cool that a lot of your writing or some of what you shared was about experiences that were pretty early on, like as a student or, or new resident. Did you write or, or think of those at the time or looking back? And if it was maybe both, how were those experiences different? Um, thanks, it's great to meet you. And that's, uh, that's an, a really wonderful question. Um, yeah, the, um, the poems that I read that were set in Virginia were written while I was living here, um, and they have been uh, revised over the years, and I think sometimes having a little bit of critical distance um, and uh, realizing what needs to be, you know, maybe a little bit illustrated in order to be visible, because I think when you're living here and you're living as a medical student, um, it's the water you swim in, and it's a little bit hard to remember um, you know, what needs to be explained or, or sort of um, sensorily heightened so that the, the reader or the listener can, can have the experience that you're having. So, um, so a little distance definitely helped in the revision process. Um, but yeah, I, um, I was really lucky to get my start um, as 
uh, someone who you know began to take my own poetry practice seriously while I was um, a student of medicine here. And that was a huge gift of the Hook Scholars Program and the really kind people across the street um, in the creative writing and the English departments for just allowing me to keep crossing back and forth and um, uh, bridging those worlds. So um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think I, um, while not all of those poems that I wrote during that time wound up in this book. In fact, very few did because you start to think about, you know, how does a book have a kind of plot arc? How does it talk to itself? How do different themes kind of braid in and out? So not all of them quite fit the larger story that I was trying to tell. Um, but I think there is, um, there's a kind of beginner's mind that you have as the student that I tried desperately to cling to um, now that I'm supposedly not a learner anymore, though of course I am, but um, it's, uh, it's so challenging to retain that, um, uh, that, that curiosity, that um, sort of sponginess, that just sort of um, infinite receptivity that I think you have very, very early in your training. Um, and it's uh, such a precious gift. So I'm, I am envious of you that you are still um, kind of in that cognitive and imaginative phase. And I, um, I try very hard to re-inhabit that as much as I can. Welcome, Laura. Um, hi. So I, I, this is a comment. Um, I think the poems were read so beautifully and until I heard them and heard you reading them, uh, they didn't mean half as much to me than just from off the page. So thank you for that. Thanks a lot, Danny. I, I think it's really a challenge to figure out. Um, I know this wasn't a question, it was a comment, but um, you know, I before I was into poetry, my kind of first love among the arts was, was music. Um, and so I want the poems to have kind of a second life in music and in rhythm and in meter and for them to um, have a kind of thorough sense, even apart from the um, sort of precise contents of, of all the sort of linguistic bits. And um, that creates a kind of competition or tension when you're composing. Um, it's kind of like, wh which is gonna win out in this next choice I'm gonna make on the page? Is it gonna be the, the sonic quality or is it gonna be the sort of, um, I don't know, whatever philosophical thing I'm wrestling with. And so um, I, I think it's, it's fun to have those kind of internal um, debates and struggles because it, for me, it's like a very generative tension, but it's a tension nonetheless, for sure. We do have a question online, so I'll, I'll hop to that one. This person says, um, hi, Laura, thank you for sharing these beautiful poems and stories from your life in medicine and poetry. I'm wondering if you have any practical tips for balancing your writing practice with your job. How do you stay motivated to write when you are tired or stressed? And do you have a routine that helps you keep on writing? That's such a great question. I wish I had it all figured out. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Um, I remember when I first got my um, my, my student, my shorter white coat, I thought, wow, like this has been completely designed for me because it is mostly pockets. Um, and, uh, I still feel that way about my longer and even more poly, you know, multiple pocketed, um, white coat, which is, uh, that I, um, I would never know when a word or a phrase or an idea was going to, come to me. And so I would write it on a little scrap of paper. Sometimes I would, you know, tear off a little corner of um, whatever, you know, notes or printout or study materials I had, you know, just tear off a little bit, write a line, stick it in my white coat pocket. And um, you can do this while you're standing in line for coffee, while you're waiting for the elevator, while you're filing in and out of a lecture hall, while you're waiting outside a patient's room, but the nurse is taking vital signs. You know, there are these little kind of 10 second moments all throughout the clinical day um, or the academic and scholarly day. And uh, it obviously would not be enough to have a, a complete thought, a complete, you know, sort of moment of art making, but it, but it was enough to make me feel like I was trying to like tune in my inner radio to sort of frequencies of creativity and imagination. And then when I would get a day off, I would like literally hold my coat upside down and shake it out and um, the bits would fly everywhere. And, uh, and then you have these like wonderful mosaic tiles that you can play with when you have a little bit more time and think, oh, I wonder if like that image maybe fits with 
this idea or this thing that I feel you know, guilty or worried about, or this bit of history that I just heard, or, um, and you can kind of um, make mosaic arrangements from there. So that, that was one, um, you know, very tactile thing that I did, but, but I think, um, you know, even uh, a, a part, if, if that's not your style, if that sounds um, terrifyingly chaotic, then I do think seizing these, these tiny pockets of time um, is a huge part of it. Um, and I always felt like, um, although being um, a medical student or a physician um, is uh, exhausting a lot of the time, and, and so is honestly, you know, being a poet and working hard at that, but they're, they're kind of tapping from two different wells. And so when I would switch from one to the other, I didn't feel like I was um, sort of depleting further resource from the one because there's such very, very different parts of the mind and heart um, that, uh, I don't know. They 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 both left me um, feeling more more abundant and more more refreshed than I would have been without them. Thank you. I think that's such a great point about kind of these little scraps in these short interstices of the day, and really kind of late to later on. Even if you're exhausted, maybe those little scraps are the thing that kind of regenerates the engine, the spark that kind of helps you create something longer. And that's, yeah. that's definitely been true in my experience as well. Yeah. What's your process you're in? So, um, similarly, I often will take notes often on my phone and I'll text myself lines and I found it really helpful to kind of have prompts or ideas or projects sort of going in the back of my head mm -hmm. as a generative practice. So, um, either having a, a book idea that I'm writing towards or having a certain goal or a type of poem or form that I wanted to experiment with, with was really helpful. Um, I think also creating the conditions in which you are most creative, which for me tends to be at night on my couch with my cup of tea right before bed <laughs> Yeah. for somebody else. It may be first thing in the morning, you know, before anything starts. So finding those conditions and giving yourself that, that little space and time to create as much as possible. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I know that um, you and I both make work that is not um, strictly formal all the time, mm -hmm. but sometimes plays with um, uh, techniques that are driven from like formal poetry or more kind of constraint driven poetry that is sort of a little more rule oriented or, or um, you know, ha has a kind of internal logic. And, and sometimes I wonder if this is true for you, but like um, forcing myself at least as an exercise to write something that's a little bit more formally driven is great because then you have, um, you already have kind of an exoskeleton of the form and then you're kind of hanging, hanging different, um, sort of trinkets and baubles and, mm -hmm. and details and images on it, um, on something that's already kind of been built by long tradition. Right. Um, I think that's true. And I think, you know, as somebody who doesn't have an academic background in English or creative writing, it was sort of a way for me to just Google, what is a sonnet? How do I make a <laughs> sestina? And yeah. kind of give myself a little bit of education or sometimes invented form. I would just decide I want to, you know, end the last line of every stanza with a particular word and that's mm -hmm. going to be my challenge. So I think sometimes that is helpful. Sort of like the tennis net analogy that you yeah. gave in your talk. I really loved that. Um, kind of creating those boundaries for yourself because sometimes when you are so tired and stressed out, to just look at the blank page can be very intimidating. Yeah. So I agree, that is really helpful. Yeah, making it a game again yes. for yourself, <laughs> definitely. I'm curious, um, it's very clear from your poems how your medical practice influences your art making, but how does your um, poetry, if it does, how does that impact the way that you approach your clinical work and also your work as an ethicist? Um, I think in a few ways. So, so one that I talked about was kind of the obstinacy that it makes you a stubborn person. And I think that that can be helpful um, to a degree. Um, but, but I think another is, um, I mean, John Keats famously talks about negative capability. Um, and, and what he meant by that was that when he was kind of in flow as poet, um, he felt like he could um, kind of temporarily uh, inhabit this state of mind in which um, anything might be true or not true. He was not gonna kind of lock down or anchor on a particular ending, on a particular belief, on a particular philosophy. He was going to be sort of this, um, just sort of uh, satellite dish for, for all ideas without feeling like he had to kind of clamp down on one of them. And I think that that's, that's certainly how I think about poetry writing is it's a place where you can entertain all possibilities and not say, well, you know, oh, I, well, I definitely believe this. So this is where I'm going to end it. Or, um, you know, this is the way I want to present to the world. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that, um, that you kind of allow for um, 
uh, a little more dwelling in uncertainty and a little bit more experiment or playfulness. And I think that um, that's certainly helped me as a doctor too, because it's, it's a practice in kind of not, um, you know, anchoring diagnostically or therapeutically too, that I think we, we all have this tendency where we want to get to the ending as soon as possible as clinicians too, not just as writers, um, and want to say, uh, okay, I've, I've found the tidy solution. She has this, so we're going to give her that, um, and, and kind of, uh, tend to sort of, uh, foreclose on on the differential um, as quickly as possible, and and both both in the kind of sense of you know being an internist, but also just uh, in, in all the other skill sets that we have as people who are trying to understand our patients' emotional needs or understand how we fit into a uh, institutional system. You know, I think in all of those different realms, we we try often to get to the answer and get to a belief as quickly as possible. So I think having a little artistic practice that is about reveling in uncertainty and kind of reveling in the mystery um, has been a helpful carryover then into my, my clinical life. That's so well said. It reminds me of Emily Dickinson dwelling in possibility. Yeah. That idea of just, yeah, having fun and playing with it in kind of a low risk, a low stakes environment. So that when we are in that higher stakes mm -hmm. medical environment, we, we are not quite so uptight about it and we can have a little bit of fun with it and give ourselves room to think. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and the humility to mm -hmm. permit that too, Absolutely. to revise too. I mean, I think like as poets, um, we're sort of proud of, of how much re revision goes into the work often. It's like, wow, this, like, I must really be a serious poet because I've made 30 drafts of this poem. <laughs> Whereas like, if you were a clinician and you were to like admit that, like, I had to try 30 times to figure out what I was doing here. Like people would never say that because there's so much shame that attaches to not knowing what to do right away. But I feel like if we could um, uh, sort of like slough off the shame and embrace revision as something mm -hmm. to be proud of uh, as like a real accomplishment, that that would be hugely useful to our own emotional well-being as doctors. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I, I agree. And I want to make sure we um, get to at least one of the other questions. There's a couple more that have popped up in the chat. Um, one person asks how the arts could be used to foster the cause of social justice, or perhaps more accurately, all the various social justices. How do you see poetry in particular contributing to the work of making the world a more just and inclusive place? Oh, that's such a big question. Um, I think, um, I mean, part of it comes back again to humility of revision um, and to um, trying to imaginatively inhabit other walks of life, other ways of being, but then not, um, not in an appropriative way, in a way that says like, wow, I'm trying so hard to imagine this and, and kind of this is where the wall is for me because that um, hopefully prompts you into conversation and community and um, a sort of, uh, humble um, um, question posing of, of other people, of other um, adventures and challenges and, and constraints and tensions that, that um, if one has not lived um, you know, experientially can be very hard to kind of cross that imaginative gulf. So I think that the, the curiosity that um, is often the engine of poetry is then um, extremely helpful socially, culturally, politically, uh, or at least I, I hope it might be. I don't know, what do you think? Yeah. I think that's really well said. I mean, the only thing that I'll add is I think something you do very well and that I, I think about a lot as well is self-implication, both on and off the page and sort of using the arts, particularly when I'm writing poetry as a way to, to figure out how do I actually contribute to what's going on here? And then what can I do about that? And to kind of put myself in the poem and not let myself off the hook. Mm -hmm. And I feel myself bringing that into clinical counter encounters too. And you know, when it's appropriate and necessary, calling myself out, you know, because mm -hmm. we all put our foot in our mouths, we yeah. all make assumptions and sort of becoming aware of that and not being scared to implicate myself as a part of the process of getting to a more just place. Totally. I think everything you said, I completely agree with. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that's right. Great. Well, I, I realize that it's 1259, so I want to be respectful of time. I know we could probably talk all yeah, afternoon. This flew by. This I'm sorry. An honor. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, so hopefully we can do a part two someday. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I just want to thank everyone for participating and attending, whether you were in person or online in today's Medical Center Hour. And I especially want to thank Dr. Laura Colby for visiting us, her alma mater, um, and for sharing Little Pharma with us. And please, please pick up a copy. You can get it directly from University of Pittsburgh Press or from your local bookstore. I New encourage Dominion. You also, New Dominion, yeah. yes, the local books are here. I encourage you to get your copies, you know, for the holidays, for any sort of occasion that you want to give a lovely gift to someone because it's a fantastic book. So thank you for being here. Um, thank you all for participating today.